Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon 21, live from Los Angeles, Lisa Martin with Dave Nicholson. And we've got a CUBE alum back with us. Webb Brown is back, the co-founder and CEO of KubeCost. Webb, welcome back. Thank you so much. It is great to be back. It's been right at two years. Um, a lot's happening in our community and ecosystem as well as with our open source project and, and company. So awesome to be back. So give the audience an overview in case they're not familiar with KubeCost and then talk to us about this explosive growth that you've seen since we last saw you in person. Yeah, absolutely. So KubeCost provides uh, cost management solutions purpose built for teams running Kubernetes and cloud native. Right, so um, everything we do is built on open source. All of our products can be installed in minutes. We give teams visibility into spend, then help them optimize it and govern it over time. Um, so it's, it's been a busy two years since we last talked. Um, we have grown the team about you know, 5X, so like right around 20 people today. Um, we now have thousands of mostly medium and large size enterprises using the product. Um, you know, that's north of a 10x growth since we launched just before, you know, KubeCon San Diego. Um, now managing billions of dollars of spin um, and, you know, feel like we're just getting started. Uh, so it's an incredibly exciting time uh, for us as a company and also just great to be back in person with, Isn't you know, it? our friends in the community. This community is, is such a strong community and it's great to see people back absolutely, here, I agree. Absolutely, absolutely. So Coupe cost, obviously you talk about cost optimization, but it's, you're, really, you're, a, you're an insight engine in the sense that if you're looking at cost, you have to measure that against what you're getting for that cost. Absolutely. So what, what are some of the insights that your platform or that your, your, your tool set Yeah, provides? absolutely. So you know, we think about our product as first and foremost like visibility and monitoring, and then insights and optimization, and then governance. Um, you know, if you talk to most teams today, they're still kind of getting that visibility, but once you do, it quickly leads into how do we optimize. And there we're going to give you insights at every part of the stack, right? So like at the infrastructure layer, thinking about things like spot and RIs and savings plans, et cetera. At the Kubernetes orchestration layer, thinking about things like auto scalings and you know, setting requests and limits, et cetera, all the way up to like the application layer with all of that being purpose built for you know, cloud native Kubernetes. Um, so the way we work is you deploy our product in your environment, anywhere you're running Kubernetes 1.11 or above will run, and we're going to start dynamically generating these insights in minutes. And they're real time, and again, they scale to the largest Kubernetes clusters in the world. And you said you have you have a lot of thousand or so customers in the medium to large enterprise. These are large organizations, probably brand names I imagine we are familiar with that are leaning on KubeCost to help get that visibility that before they did not have the ability to get. Absolutely, absolutely. So definitely our users of our thousands of users skews heavily towards you know medium and large size enterprise. Um, working with some amazing companies like Adobe, who you know just have such high scale and like complex and sophisticated infrastructure. Um, so, you know, I think this is very natural in what we expect, which is like, as you start spending more resources, you know, missing visibility, having unoptimized infrastructure, starts to be more costly. Absolutely. Um, and we typically see is once that gets into like the, the multiple headcount, right, uh, it starts to, you know, spend some, make, make sense to spend some time optimizing and monitoring and, you know, putting alerting in place um, so you can manage it more effectively uh, as time goes on. Do you have any, any metrics or any X factor ranges of, of the cost that you've actually saved customers? Yeah, I mean, we've saved multiple customers in them like many of millions of dollars at this point. So we're talking big, big Really numbers, big, so big yeah, figures. we're now you know, managing more than $2 billion of spend. So like some really big savings on a per customer base. Uh, but it's really common where we're saving you know, north of 30%, sometimes up to 70% on your Kubernetes and related spend. And so we're giving you insights into your Kubernetes cluster and again, the full stack there, but also giving you visibility and insights into external things like external disk or you know, cloud storage buckets or you know, cloud SQL, that, that sort of stuff, external cloud services. Taking those blinders off. Exactly, and giving you that unified, you know, real-time picture, again, that accurately reflects everything that's going on in your body. So when these insights are produced or revealed, um, are the responses automated or are they then 
manually applied? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, we support both, and we support both in, in different ways. Um, by default, when you deploy KubeCost, and again, it's, today it's Helm install, it can be running in your cluster in you know, minutes or less. Um, it's deployed in read-only mode. And by the way, you don't share any data externally, it's all in your local environment. Um, so we start gen generating these insights, r you know, right when you install in your and, environment. And, and let me ask about. I'm sorry to, to interrupt, but 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 when you when you say you're generating an insight, are you just giving an answer and guidance, or are you providing the reader background on what leads to that insight? Yeah. Do, do, do you, or, you know, is that a philosophical question? Of do you need to provide the user rationale for yeah. the insight? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're doing this today, and we'll do more. But one example is. Um, you know, if you just look at this notion of setting requests and limits for your applications in Kubernetes, um, you know, if you, in simple forms, if you set a request too high, you're you know, potentially wasting money because the Kubernetes scheduler is provisioning that resource for you. If you set it too low, you're at risk of being CPU throttled, right? So communicating that you know, symbiotic relationship and the risk on either side really helps team understand why I need to strike this balance, right? It's not just cost, it's performance and reliability as well. So absolutely given that background, and again, out of the box, we're read only, but you, we also have automation in our product with our cluster controller, so you can dynamically do things like right size your infrastructure or you know, move workloads to spot, et cetera. But we also have integrations with a bunch of tooling in this ecosystem, so like Prometheus native, you know, Alert Manager native, um, just launched an integration with Spinnaker and Armory, where you can like dynamically at the time of deployment, you know, right size and have insights. So um, you can expect to see more from us there, but we very much think about automation as twofold. One, you know, building trust and coop costs and our insights and adopting them over time. But then two is meeting you where you are with your existing tooling, whether it's your CI CD pipeline, observability, or you know, existing kind of workflow automation system. Meeting customers where they are is, is critical these days. Absolutely, I think especially in this market, right, where we have the potential to have so much interoperability and all these things working in harmony. Um, and also, you know, there's a, there's a lot of booths back here, right? So we, you know, we have complex tech stacks yes. and, you know, in certain cases we feel like when we bring you to our UI or APIs or, you know, automation or CLIs, we can do things more effective. But oftentimes, when we bring that data to you, we can be more effective. Again, that's you know, coming, bringing your data to Chronosphere or Prometheus or Grafana, um, you know, all of the tooling that you're already using uh, on a on a daily, regular basis. And bringing that data to the tool is is you know just another example of the the value in data that if organizations can actually harness that value and unlock it. Yeah. There's so much potential there for them to be more competitive, for them to be able to develop products and services faster. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're just seeing the, the coming of age with you know, cost metrics into that equation. Um, we now live in a world uh, with Kubernetes as this amazing innovation platform where as an engineer, I can go spin up some pretty costly resources really fast. And that's a great thing for innovation, right? But it also kind of pushes some of the accountability or awareness down to the individual IC who needs to be aware, you know, what, you know, things generally cost at a minimum in like a, a directional way. Um, so they can make informed decisions, again, when they think about this cost, performance, reliability trade-off. Where are your customer conversations? Are, are your target users DevOps folks? I'm just wondering where finance might be in this whole yeah, game. Yeah, it's a, it's a great, great question. Um, given, the fact that we are kind of open source first and started with open source, um, we, you know, 95% of the time start working with an infrastructure engineering team or DevOps team. They've already installed our product. They're already familiar with what we're doing. Um, but then increasingly and increasingly fast, you know, finance is being brought into the equation and, you know, management is being brought into the equation. And I think it's a function of what we were talking about where, you know, 70% of teams grew their Kubernetes spin over the last year. Uh, you know, 20% of them more than doubled. Um, so, you know, these are starting to be real, you know, expense items where finance is increasingly aware of what's going on. So yeah, they're coming into the picture, but it's, it's simply talk, you know, starting with and, and working with the infrastructure team that's actually kind of putting some of these insights into action or hooking us into their pipelines, that sort of thing. Well, when you, when you think of developers going out and grabbing resources, um, and you think of a, 
an insight tool that looks at controlling cost, that could seem like an inhibitor, but really, if you're talking about to, how to efficiently use whatever resources you have to be able to have access to yeah. in terms of dollars, you could sell this to the developers on that basis. It's like, look, you have these 10 things that you want to be able to do. If you don't optimize using a tool like this, you're only going to be able to do four of them. Without a doubt, yeah. And, right? and you know, us as so our, our founding team, all engineers, um, you know, we were the ones getting those questions of, um, you know, how have we already spent, you know, our budget on just this project? We have these three others we want to do, right? Or why are costs going up as quickly as they are? You know, what are we spending on this application? Um, instead of that kind of being a manual lift, like let me go do a bunch of analysis or come back with answers, it's tools to where not only can management answer those questions themselves, but like the engineering teams can make informed opportunity costs and optimizations decisions itself. Whether it's tooling and automation doing it for them or them applying things you know, directly themselves. So a lot of growth, you talked about the growth in employees, the growth in revenue. What lies ahead for KubeCost? What are some of the things that are coming on the horizon that you're really excited about? Yeah, we very much feel like we're just getting started. You know, just like we feel this ecosystem and community is, right? Like, there's been tons of progress all around, but like, wow, it's still early days. Um, so, you know, we we did raise, you know, five and a half million dollars from, you know, first round, um, who's an amazing group to work with at the end of last year. Um, so by, you know, growing the engineering team, we're able to do a lot more. We got a bunch of really big things coming across all parts of our product. Um, you can think about one thing we're really excited that's in limited availability right now um, is our, our first hosted solution. It's our first SaaS solution. Um, and this is critically important to us in that we want to give teams the option to, if you want to own and control your data and never egress anything outside of your cluster, you can do that with our deployed product. You can do that with our open source. You can truly lock down namespace egress and never send a byte out. Or if you'd like the convenience of us to manage it for you and be kind of stewards of your data, we're, we're going to offer you know, a great offering there too. So that's in limited availability today. We're going to have a lot more announcements coming there. Um, but we see those being at feature parity um, you know, between like our enterprise offerings and our you know, hosted solution. Um, and just you know, a lot more coming with you know, visibility, some more like GPU insights, you know, metrics coming quickly, a lot more um, with automation coming, and then more integrations for governance. Again, you kind of talked about Spinnaker and things like that. A lot more really interesting ones coming. So five and a half million raised in the last round of funding. Where are you going to be applying that? What, what are some of the, the growth and engines that you want to tune with that money? Yeah, so um, you know, first and foremost, it was really growing the engineering team, right? So we've you know, like four x the engineering team in the, in the last year, and just have an amazing group of engineers. We want to continue to do that. Um, we're kind of super early on the like you know marketing sales side. We're going to start thinking about that more and more. You know, our approach first off was like we want to solve a really valuable problem and doing it in a way that is super compelling. Um, and we think that when you do that, you know, good things happen. I think that's some of our Google background, which is like you build a great search engine and like you know good things you know generally happen. Um, so we're just super focused on again working with great users, um, you know, building great products that meet them where they are and solve problems that are really important to them. Awesome. Well, congratulations on all the trajectory of success since we last saw you in Thank person. You. Great to have you back on the show. So great. Looking forward to it. So folks can go to, to coopcost.com yep. to learn more and see some of those announcements coming down the pike. Absolutely, yeah. Don't make it two years before you come back. I would love to be back. I hope we're you know, back <laughs> Don't wait two bigger years. than ever you know, next year. Um, but it has been such a pleasure, you know, last time and this time. Thank you so much for having me, you know. Lo love being part of, you know, the show and the community at large. It's a great community. And we appreciate you sharing all your insights. Thank you so much. All right. For Dave Nicholson, I'm Lisa Martin, coming to you live from Los Angeles. This is theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 21. We'll be back with our next guest shortly. We'll see you then.